Father God, Lord, in the midst of our brokenness, when all the world thought you had failed, Lord, you succeeded. You overcame. You won. Father God, is it, is, it is in those moments for our lives that we know that you are good, that you never fail. And time and time again, you meet us where we are. You save us. You rescue us. Because you are all powerful. Lord, we thank you for how you are there every single time. We love you, Father. Amen. Warehouse community, welcome to our second week of August. If you're like me um, and you have children that are in school, I'm pretty sad because now my oldest is in kindergarten. And um, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of time to just reflect because it's not as crazy in the house and it's a little bit quieter. Um, if, you, if you have a child that has gone off to college, raise your hand. Any, any, yeah, there's a few of you. Maybe you're a little bit happier, maybe you're not. Um, if you're happy, don't let us know. I just want your children to, to know that you really still miss them. Um, but like me, kindergarten is, is a big deal because uh, Adeline now is not, it's, it's, it's like the game is over. Pre-K is like fun. And kindergarten now, like you have to be on time and, and you can't miss that much school. And um, so the expectations are a little bit higher. So this is, this is kind of the back to school week. And a lot of us have really... Uh, either have been seeing posts of, of sad parents and happy parents of, of kids who are going to a new school. And I know there's a lot of that happening, transitions of, of just different uh, parts of life, whether they're going into middle school or high school. Uh, this week has just been full of that and emotion. And I've been hearing some of the stories and I'm one of those parents. So I, I resonate with you all. Uh, I, I mourn with you as um, my child has slowly growing, and it's just one of those moments where it becomes real for me. Um, but now that she's gone back to school, I just couldn't think, I couldn't help to reflect on my own experiences when I was her age. And one of the things that you don't know um, about, may, you may not know about me, and things are going to get a little bit personal today, if you don't mind me sharing a little bit about myself. Um, and maybe you don't know, but uh, I grew up in this part of town, and I went to Fleece. And Adeline is in the same classroom that I was in, and it still has the same tile on the walls. Although they did put new paint and new carpet, it looks a lot better. Um, but there's a lot of things that haven't changed. And I couldn't help but think, what were some of the life lessons that I learned when I was in kindergarten or just in my early childhood? You see, we learn a lot of lessons, and, and as we grow and as we interact and we engage with other people and teachers and, and the things that we do, there's my little one that just came up here. Hey, what's going on? I'm going to hand her back to her mother. This one's not in the kindergarten, but she might as well be. Um, as we grow, we learn life lessons. She'll learn one soon. Isla, not my wife. Um, but we, we grow up, and there are things that we learn from our experiences. We make mistakes, and we learn from them. And our parents tell us not to do things, and our teachers tell us what's right and what's wrong. And I, and I tried to think, and there aren't many things that I can remember except for probably the ones that involved a, a, a Hispanic old-school father that involved discipline. Those are the ones that I really do remember uh, and I had shared one of those stories a while back. I'm not going to share one of those today. But I won't forget those, and that is for sure. But growing up, I can say that I had a, a pretty good childhood. Um, I, 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 I had hardworking parents. Um, I went to great schools. I never had anything that I can remember that was super 
traumatic. I, I'd say I had it pretty good. My sister's 11 years older than me. And um, I pretty much was an only child because she had moved out when I was in fifth grade or, or so. Um, so I got everything I wanted. And it was pretty nice. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Um, but growing up, there were lessons. And one of the things that you learn as a child is the idea of obedience. And when we associate that word, or, or we try to find that word, if I were to go around this room and say, how do you define obedience? It'd probably vary. That's based upon your upbringing, the things that you learn, and, and you would probably have a little bit of a different definition of what obedience means to you. Now, if you were raised in the church, you knew that we associated the idea most of the time with obedience with one of the commandments, which is honor your father and your mother. That was, that was the big one. That's the one that sometimes parents hold over your head is you better honor your father and your mother. But we associate with obedience with that commandment. But I do remember one lesson, and, and this was specifically revolving around obedience, and it may not make sense to you now, but as my story unfolds a little bit, and we go into to scripture, it may make a little bit more sense. If we went around this room today, and, and you told me about a time when you met Jesus, you, you would probably quickly remember that moment. You could probably define it where Jesus came into your life, where you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. And I'm speaking to the ones who have, and maybe some of you haven't, but you remember that, that story and, and that experience, and you can associate certain things with that specific moment. But when it comes to your calling, when it comes to what God has put you in this world to do, what he's, what he's asked of you, one of the biggest things that we must do is we must be obedient. That is how we remain true to our calling. See, the question we should be more concerned about when we're younger, when you're, I'm talking to, the, to, to some of you who are leaving childhood and adolescence going, even becoming young adults, or even in the world right now, and you're just struggling with your identity, we, we shouldn't be so concerned about the what, the how, and the when, but the question is the why. Understanding your why will really influence who you are as a person, why you do things, your identity, your purpose, and belonging, the three things that all of us as humans really search for as we're growing up. We want to know, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? How can I make a difference? What am I called to do? Identity, purpose, and belonging. So we must ask the question, why? Paul had just preached a sermon of the unknown God back in Acts 17. And I had the privilege of actually visiting um, where Paul preached back in college. I, I studied um, the Greek language, biblical Greek in Greece. And I got to go to this place where Paul had actually preached this sermon. I stood on the rock where he was and he, um, the tour guide, uh, he strategically told us that, uh, or Paul strategically was placed in this position where the philosophers could hear him, but also the people that were actually there to also um, listen to what he had to say could hear him. And this, this specific place where he projected and he talked, there was philosophers down below him and they, would, they could hear what he was saying. You see, this certain place in Athens, there was a lot of smart people, a lot of philosophy, a lot of ideas being thrown around. He was in the Mecca of of, of a lot of revolutionary thoughts. And here Paul is talking about this unknown God that they don't know. And he's wanting the philosophers to hear. And he's wanting the people who came to hear him also hear what he has to say. And then we roll into Acts 18. And, and you can imagine in a place that had differing ideas from Paul, some of the things that he might face. But it, is in, it was in his obedience that he remained faithful to God's call for his own life. And so hey, Paul, he's, he's at a crossroads here and he's been facing a lot of tension. A lot of people have been telling him that he is preaching false teachings, almost to the point of persecution 
and beatings. And so, like anybody, whenever we face tension and things are going bad, we kind of question our position in life. And, and maybe you're not one of those people, but there are many of us who, when we face opposition, we question, are we really doing the right thing? And so Paul is at a crossroads in Acts 18, verse 9 through 11, and we'll, we'll quickly read that if you have your Bibles and it'll be up on the screen, starting in verse 9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack or harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Paul is at a crossroads. He's questioning his calling, his approach, his effectiveness, his worth. And in this very moment is when Jesus makes himself known. The original language tells us that he was laying down. It was in this moment where he, everything, all this rush of emotion and thought came to Paul. And now he begins to wrestle with God because he's afraid. He's questioning his purpose, his identity. Does he even belong in this part of the world? Is this where he's supposed to be? Should he even be preaching the gospel anymore? Has his time come to an end? And I don't know about you, but for me, so many times I, I see myself living so reactively. I, I wake up in the morning, I do my thing, I, I check my email or whatever, there's a text for work, and I immediately start responding to the things that need the most care at the time that that's what I think. Well, there's an email I need to respond to this, or someone needs something, I need to go do this. And we live in this constant state of being reactive and not so much proactive about life. And it isn't until I lay down at night that... I start to wonder the things that I didn't do and I begin to worry and I start thinking of, of finances and, and just things I have to do for work and responsibilities and things that we need to get for our children, whatever it, whatever it is. That's when my mind just starts going a million miles an hour. Maybe you're like me, when you lay down, that is when it happens. See, my father is very different. He's actually, right now, they're, they're building a house out in, in, in Eustis, and it's my, it's my dad's second time doing this. The first time he said, I'm never building a house again. Um, and he, he's kind of subcontracting the whole thing. And um, so time in, here, once in a while, we'll talk about it. And he'll tell me a little bit about the issues of, if you know, if you've been following and journeying with us, you know the issues we have with the warehouse and getting supplies. And Pastor Mark talked about that in his, um, in his time up here. And we know that it's been difficult to build and he tells me about the hurdles of working with the city and getting things approved and I'm like man dad how do you how do you sleep at night and he looked at me and said I closed my eyes <laughs> and I said I wish I had that mentality but I'm the opposite when I lay down is when I begin to turn and and I I, I obsess and I worry and it's in those moments where I am like Paul, where I begin to question things. And I've had moments in my life where I say, God, is this where I'm supposed to be? God, are you even there right now? It's, it's my pillow talk with God. And it's honest. But it hasn't always been that way. See, Paul was being transparent in his obedience, in his relationship with God, even though he was doubting himself, even though he was full of fear because of what was happening around him. Obedience is not simply an act of receiving direction and guidance from God, but it is also an act of returning your honesty, your transparency to God. And Paul was being transparent with God and God in return. I'm teaching my children about obedience. The oldest one who understands it a little bit better and simply right now, it's doing what mom and dad ask of her, to brush her teeth, to get ready for bed, to get her backpack, to do this and that. And that, that is part of her idea of learning obedience. But it's also communicating her feelings to mom and dad. Obedience isn't just receiving direction, but it's also returning honesty and transparency. It is so in our relationship with God. And here Paul is having an honest moment with God as he's laying down 
ready to go to bed. He is struggling. He's questioning everything. Paul was facing, facing so much opposition. You could say this was the harder road for Paul. All signs would lead to the outside observer. If you were looking at his life and what he was doing in his journey, if, you, if this was a movie, you were watching it, you'd be like, man, it's time to just hang it up. It's time to quit. You're, you're facing way too much struggle. This is not where you probably should be. But still, Paul remained faithful and honest and open and obedient and transparent. And from, and from what we know, the conversation that he was having with God was a hard one. It was in the most vulnerable and honest moment that Paul's having that God shows himself and he gives him a command and he says, do not fear. I like this story so much because it reminds me of myself. Lost, confused, discouraged, and really no direction in my life. My faith was tested and depleted to the point that I was questioning the existence of God himself. It's part of my story and it's why I'm here today and what I'm doing today because of that story. You see, I wouldn't have a story to tell if it wasn't for Jesus. If it wasn't for God meeting me in my lowest point. You see, I had decided that I wasn't going back to school. I was, at, I was attending Southern, and, and, and before that, I had graduated. Um, I didn't want to leave this part of town, so I decided to enroll at UCF, and that was back when UCF stood for uh, two things, you can't finish, and under construction forever. And here's why. And maybe, some, maybe it's still that way. I have no idea. Still is. Amen. So when I got there, it was an explosion of students, and there was 55,000 people on that campus, and you couldn't even register for classes because they'd fill up, so you could never finish. And they were still building parking garages and places to, so you can park. And so I, would, I remember the days where I had to follow somebody to their car, the most creepy thing probably ever, but it was normal on the campus of UCF. Uh, back then you could say, hey, I'll take you to your car. So they'd jump in, stranger jumps in your car before Uber was a thing. And you, they'd take them there and you take their spot. Uh, and I w it was a shock to me because I, 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 I went here to this school, much smaller, not used to having 400 kids in a class with a microphone and you have to raise your hand and ask a question. And I'm like, I'm not asking a math question with all these kids in here. It was just, it was a, a, a such a drastic change and experience for me. And I knew that deep down, I knew God didn't want me there, but I decided that's where I was going to be. And it wasn't until I made a trip up to the school where I attended, which was Southern in, in Tennessee, that uh, we went there for a weekend to visit a friend who was studying theology, where I walked on that campus, and it was just this feeling of God telling me, you need to be here. So I made the decision, I enrolled, and um, decided to go to Southern, and, and uh, throughout that year, um, it was really expensive, school's expensive. Uh, a number of things began to happen where I began to take my relationship, because I was so surrounded by it, I, I began to take my relationship with God for granted. And slowly God became just a thought, and slowly I began pushing him away to the point where I said, I don't really don't need to be here. And so at the time I was dating, who is now my wife, Vanessa, and I told her that summer, that next summer, that I wasn't going back. And that we would work it out. And I remember sending her flowers like the next day, because I, you know, I knew... Um, this is going to be a tough road. And, and so the journey began, and my disobedience continued to push God further and further away to the point where I began to ask the question, God, are you even real? And I remember I was working at Florida Hospital at the time, Florida Hospital Altamont. Now I guess it's Advent Health Altamont. And I, and I remember... Um, driving through uh, on 436, there was a Bally's. That was where, like, if you couldn't afford the RDV, you went to Bally's. That was like the next best thing. They had a pool, and now I don't. It's like a furniture. It's becoming a furniture store or something. 
and there was a Home Depot on the right. And I remember driving through there in my car to work at 6.45 in the morning saying, just having, a, just having it out with God if there was one. And I said, God, if you're real, you need to show me today. So I get to work. I'm working transportation, and I'm just not in the mood. It's Friday. And I'm not in the mood. I'm ready to get to the weekend, and I'm just, like, so confused, lost in my thoughts, don't know if there is a creator out there. And uh, I meet this guy. His name's Christopher. Christopher is on dialysis. Young guy, youngish guy. Um, I used to say old guy, and now I'm 34, and now I think I'm calling him young. And uh, I remember taking him to to dialysis, and I wasn't saying much, but he just started rambling. He's like, hey, man, this is, what's my name? Da, da, da. I started talking, and in my head, I'm like, this is, this is the patient who has ever, who's talked the most ever. And he's just going and going, telling me a little bit about his life, and asked me if I go to church. And I'm like, well, I, and my, I said yes, that's the right answer. At the time, I didn't know if I'd ever be going back to church. And uh, he he proceeds to tell me the church he goes to, and, and we, I'm about to drop him off to dialysis, and he's like, hey, man, I'd like to visit your church. And he said, I can't drive because of my condition. And he said, can I have your number? I'd, I'd like to visit. And so, again, I give my number in my head. I'm thinking, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to church next week. Who knows? So later that night, I'm talking to Vanessa, and it's 935, and I get a phone, another call on the other line, and I said, this guy... Switch over, said Vanessa, hold on. And at the time, she knew what was going on, the the struggle and what I was, kind of what I was going through. And he says, hey, it's Christopher. And I said, oh, hey. And he's beating around the bush, telling me, kind of, he got, I knew there was something he had to say. I felt it. And he said, I got discharged. And I said, he's either going to ask me for a ride to church um, or something else. I don't know. And he says, you know, one thing I didn't tell you was I used to be a pastor. And I got sick. And he said, whenever God has something he needs to tell, I need to tell somebody, he doesn't let me go to sleep. He said, so I'm here to tell you that God wants me to tell you that he's alive and he's well and he's in your life right now. I forgot Vanessa was on the other line. I, I mean, I'm in shock and, and we keep talking. I share a little bit. Uh, there's, I'm in tears and I switch over. She's off the phone and I call her back and I said, you cannot believe what just happened. And so here I am saying, God, I, I know you exist. I'm done. I'm not. That was, to me, that was one of those moments that you hear a lot of, but it never happens to you. It happened to me. And I knew I had this conviction. And, and the reason why all this started was because if I was going to go back to Southern, I was going to study theology. But how could I study something I didn't believe in? This is the tension that I was in. And so the next day, I said, God... If you want me to go into ministry, you need to give me a sign today. I said, why not? I'm one for one. Let's try this again. Uh, and I joked because it was Sabbath and I, nothing happened. And it's like he rested. Sunday morning. <laughs> Sunday morning. The resurrection. No. Um, I get a phone call. 9.30, 9.30 in the morning, around the same time, but in the morning. And it's a friend of mine who I hadn't seen and talked to in six months. He said, hey, man, how you doing? How's Vanessa? He knew we were dating. I used to cut his hair in the dorm at Southern. And uh, he's pastoring in Oklahoma. And I'm like, there's this, no way. This is, this is not going where I think it's going. And I take the call. I'm outside. And uh, he said, you remember um, when you used to cut my hair? And I asked you, and I told you, you should be a pastor. Do you remember what you said? And I said, yeah, I laughed. He said, you did laugh, but I'm going to forgive you for that. And uh, he said, I have been thinking about you all week, and we just had a meeting about hiring an intern pastor at church for the summer, and I just can't stop thinking of you, and I want to extend that invitation to you. By this point, I'm like down my driveway. I don't know how far away from that. I just kept walking. Like, I didn't know, like, what was happening. Like, this is crazy. I, did, I did, could not fathom what God was actually doing in that very moment, in my moment of questioning in my moment of my deepest darkest moments of my relationship with God here he is and he comes with answers long story short later that week my aunt calls me and says hey we want an intern pastor would you be interested this was here locally 
Pastor Mark's part of this story, and I don't know if he remembers this, but he spoke to my dad asking if I was around for that summer and asking if I wanted to help teach other people how to do Bible study. And I can't remember the acronym. Do you remember what it was? It was like a simple format. It's like four, four letters. SOAP. That's what it was. It, it was Scripture Observation, Application, and Prayer. And uh, thank you. So I obviously, throughout that journey and those three things, I decided to stay here and fill out my time that summer responding to the call that God had placed in my life. And the rest is history. I'm here now because of those moments in my life. But it was in my moment of darkness, in my, in my deepest moments of questioning the existence of God, in my obedience to him, even though I was having a really hard time in my life, even though I didn't know what was next, I was honest with God. I said, God, I, I don't even know if you're real. I don't even know if you exist. I went from having this conviction of a calling to now questioning the person who was calling me to now him revealing himself to me. And that's, that's the life that we live, the cycle of ups and downs. And it's easy in the downs just to forget it all, to let it go. But God calls us to obedience in our highs and in our lows. It's in our obedience that God makes himself known. Obedience is not simply receiving direction, but returning transparency and honesty to our creator. Here's the thing. Some of you have heard that voice, that tug on your heart for a better life while saying, I know this is what God wants for me in that moment, but I'm going to choose a different path because you think it's what's right for you or because it's what the guy you're chasing is doing or the girl that you've fallen in love with is doing. Or maybe that's what culture is doing. We've let culture have more of an influence than our creator. Culture has become the thing that moves us, that drives us, not so much our creator. We've got, we go a different path. We push the voice of God away, even though we know it's there, and we choose to ignore it. Do you want to be like the world? Then lie, cheat, steal. Those are easy. Hate. Hate is common. If you want to be like the world, go ahead and hate. But to love is to live uncommonly. Love is what separates us. Obedience, discipline. Those are the things that separate us from the world. And, and in my situation in my story I began to become more like the things that were around me than what God had called me to as I look back on my story I see the moments where I began to push God away to do the things that I thought were good for myself the world was crumbling around me and I decided to just go with it like Paul Paul was in a moment where he didn't know if he was supposed to be doing this anymore. He'd been living a great life. He'd been planting all these churches and moving from city to city. And now he gets into a, a pretty, pretty intense place where the teachings are very opposite of what he was teaching. And it could have been easy for him just to be quiet, to go with the flow, to go with the culture at the time. But he remembers his call to be obedient. And he says, God, in my obedience, I'm going to be honest. I'm scared. I'm terrified. I don't know what I'm going to do next. And Jesus, God, comes to him and says, do not be afraid. It is in our moments of darkness and that tension that God is most real. I've said this before. It's easy to see God when everything's great and going well in your life. But it's when we wrestle when we question if we're obedient and we're honest with ourselves, we're honest with God, 
is when he comes in, that open invitation to change our lives. I wouldn't have a story if it wasn't for Jesus. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus. God puts people in our lives to rescue us. Are you pushing those people away? Are you surrounding yourself with the people who are trying to draw you closer to him? It is through our obedience that God makes himself known, that he rescues us. If we can't be honest, if we can't return that honesty to him, there's no place for him to work in our lives. Our obedience is what defines us. It was out of obedience that Paul moved forward. Out of obedience comes action, and out of action comes results. And those results are a reflection of our purpose. You want to know your purpose, your identity, your belonging? Listen. Give your life to Christ. Ask him, what do you want of me? Our commitment to Jesus is so powerful that that in itself is what begins to shape the world around us. We were never designed to follow the culture. We were meant to create the culture. That was our calling. But we only know what our calling is if we stay in a relationship, an, an honest relationship with God. And that means sharing the dark with him, sharing the honesty, sharing the moments where you question if he's even real and, and putting him up to the challenge. I guarantee you he's going to show up. And it may not look like it did in my life, but I challenge you in your obedience, be honest. So Paul in his obedience, he moves forward not knowing what's to come. If it's anything like before, he's likely to endure some painfully physical moments. And he does. We see this later on in verse 17. I don't know what my future looks like, and I can't speak for years, but I know it's not always going to be the highs. I know there are lows, and maybe some of you are in a low moment right now. Maybe you're questioning if God is real. Maybe you're questioning the people you trust in your life. Maybe these things are just not going well. Be honest with God. Let him know. Let him know what you're going through. He died for a reason, and that reason was for us. That reason was so that we can have direct access to Jesus Christ to say, God... I am struggling, I am broken, I am in need of saving, and I need you to break through. It is in our brokenness that Jesus breaks through. Your obedience is a direct response to God's calling in your life, an honest and open response. May we live as a church in submission to Jesus, knowing that whatever is to come our way, that we can step out in faith through obedience and confidence that we have in him. Whatever you're going through, whatever relationships are broken and things that you are struggling with, may you know that you can come to the feet of Jesus and he'll meet you there. And he'll do it again and again and again. You can't wear out the grace. It's too good. He died for more than your problems. That was part of it. You know, I go to places around the world and, and I visit and I realize how small I am on the top of these mountains. How a, a wind could just blow me away. I share with you, I love mountain biking. And I was sharing the story yesterday with, with, a, with someone, with my brother-in-law. And I said, man, when I'm at the top of these mountains, um, when I'm here mountain biking, I feel like I got a good grasp of life and of what I'm doing. When I'm up there taking two gondolas to the very top, I feel so small and how something could just take me away. 
And even in the midst of how little we feel, God died for you. He paid the price. He sent his son. We have the authority to be honest and open. We have the authority, the authority to ask for him to rescue us. He died for you, for me, and you, you don't have a story if it wasn't for Jesus. We wouldn't have a story to tell as warehouse community if it wasn't for what Jesus has done in our highs and in our lows. May nothing separate us from the love that is Christ and him crucified. Father God, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we have a story to tell. And as a, a community of believers, as a, as a Forest Lake Church warehouse community, we have a story and that story is you. We have our ups, we have our downs, we have our moments, but it is in those moments that you've challenged us to be honest and open, to wrestle with you, to know that you will be there, you will rescue us. No matter how deep of a mess we're in, how confused and lost we are, you're better than that. So we thank you for who you are, we thank you for what you are doing in our lives, and we thank you that we have a story to tell. And may we remember the life lesson that you taught us. May, may we remember the moment where you came into our life. May we look back on that moment. May that be the moment that carries us through until your return. In Christ's name we pray, amen.